Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Mo Gelbart. I'm the executive director here at the Thel McMillan Center. And as always, we are thrilled and pleased that your support of our Frontiers in Addiction lecture series, which is probably, I don't know, 15, at least 15 years, if not 20 now, and each year gets better and better, and we get, as you'll see today, uh, nationally and internationally known speakers who you know, provide a great deal of information for us here. Uh, so, as I said, thanks for not only supporting this program, but for kind of helping here, us here at the Thel McMillan Center serve the community for now 26 years. Uh, I want to thank, you know, Cheryl Camby and the Meadows for being our co-sponsors here. Cheryl's in the back, and she has lots of great material about the Meadows Treatment Center. She'll also, you'll hear from her after our break. Uh, if you want more information about our program, uh, we have several, we have, I've, I've noticed lots of our staff members here, our counselors and staff members, but we have Dr. Watson, our program director here in the back, and Therese Lang is somewhere, and Colleen Capistrano. Those are people you can seek out and uh, get more information about our program. We do, I won't spend too much time. We have, as you hopefully know, an ad, adult and adolescent IOP, which is Intensive Outpatient Program. Uh, I often give a talk about how, you know, that's not the, an out, outpatient program. When indicated is actually uh, the treatment of choice. It's not the poor stepchild of, of residential. So, and one of the great things we do is, you know, we do a really good initial assessment and we help determine uh, what's the best care for somebody. And we don't take everybody because everybody's not appropriate for outpatient. You know, we're part, as you obviously know, of Torrance Memorial Hospital, which is now part of Cedars Sinai Medical Systems. And uh, so, you know, the hospital is designed and, and committed to only doing, like I say, the best and the right thing. And we're proud to be part of it. And we're really excited about today's talk, actually. Uh, <clears throat> it's such an important topic, dual diagnosis and co-occurring disorders and the connection to trauma. Uh, you know, I, in my opinion, we're, we're in an interesting place in care and treatment of substance abuse. You know, on one hand, there's tremendous discoveries in neuroscience and genetics and brain development and the role of early trauma. Uh, I know many of you here, we, we know who comes to our program. We get a lot of community people but a, and a lot of professionals and a lot of uh, psychologists and MFTs and social workers and psychiatrists. So many of you are working with patients who have experienced a great deal of trauma. And, you know, underlying trauma and underlying mental health disorders uh, greatly correlate with substance abuse. So if you're seeing those patients, hopefully you're also getting them into some kind of care. So if people get both of those things treated at the same time, it's always going to be uh, beneficial. Uh, and as part of that, you know, again, we're an IOP, and since we're talk talking about dual diagnosis, and we'll hear about that today, you know, we have a really sort of unique uh, approach to that problem here because we work with the community. Our, our dual diagnostic, diagnostic team or diagnosis team is the community at large. We have great relationships with uh, a large number of physicians in the community, with a large number of psychiatrists, um, mental health professionals, and so we're working closely with all those people. You know, our counselors are great at substance abuse treatment and at recognizing certain problems and certain problems are beyond their capability. So we work closely with the community and we're proud of that. And in fact, as I, you know, if some of you want to work with that population, we always are needing people to work closely with and refer to. So make sure you see Dr. Watson or myself at the break or at the end. Uh, <clears throat> so we're proud of what we do here. We're proud of our achievements and we need you to continue to support us so we can continue to do this for years to come. Uh, among what we do also, as you know, is lots of community things, including these lecture series. Uh, what we, our Frontiers in Addiction lecture series is in our big hall here, big auditorium, and that goes every other month. Our next one will be in September, by the way. There's uh, flyers on the back. September 19th uh, with Dr. David Sack from Promises and Elements, and he'll be talking about opioid opiate overdoses and how to prevent them. Obviously a important and current topic in, in our society here. Every month that we, every other month we have a smaller group called South Bay Networking and it's held in our center. And the next talk there is August 22nd, 8.30 to 10. 
with Katie Vernoy talking about sacrificial helping syndrome. Why do we give more than we have? It's a uh, sort of, a, I think, a take on compassion fatigue and so on. So we provide, I think, quite unusual, but again, another community service, free CEUs at both of these events, free breakfasts. So hopefully you'll keep coming. A uh, <clears throat> couple quick housekeeping things. So you get CEUs for this. I, I mentioned this you know, in detail last time. You have to stay to the end. <laughs> You know, we're, we're, we're regulated, and believe it or not, there are CEU monitors and inspectors that come around at times. And uh, if we don't, you know, if we, we don't want to be, be in a position of losing our ability to, to provide CEUs, especially, like I say, we're, we're not charging anybody for anything. We pay for the, out, for the, for the right to do that. So anyway, see, you have to stay till the end, and all CEU certificates will be given out as you leave. So don't leave at halftime and ask the, our volunteers. By the way, thank you to the volunteers who I always forget to thank, but they're here every month for years and years. And thank you. Uh, Dr. Shipman will have a break somewhere in the middle, and uh, he'll take questions and answers, I believe, at the end of, e at the end of the, before the break and as well at the end of the uh, session. Bathrooms are over to the right, and now would be a good time for myself included to shut your cell phones off. Uh, so close your cell phones and then let me have the honor of introducing our speaker. <clears throat> so Dr. Schiffman is the founder and executive director of the Camden Center as well as the founder and medical director of UCLA Di Dual Diagnosis Program. He is a diplomate of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and completed his residency in psychiatry at UCLA. He is a graduate of the MD MBA program at the University of Southern California and received a Master's of Arts degree in Linguistics from UCLA. Got a Trojan and a Bruin, all in one. Uh, he has extensive research experience in molecular biology and is the author of numerous scientific publications in these fields. Dr. Schiffman is a nationally recognized expert on addiction and co-occurring mood and anxiety disorders and was previously the chief resident of the UCLA Anxiety Disorders Program. He has written extensively on the subject of addiction, anxiety, and depression in both the academic and popular press and has provided expert opinion on these topics for numerous publications. He is a columnist for the Huffington Post and previously served as editor-in-chief of anxiety.org. And we're proud and pleased to have Dr. Schiffman here, so help me welcome him. All right, thank you. Um, before I get started, uh, let me just uh, say thank you to um, uh, the um, uh, hospital uh, as well. Uh, thank you to Colleen Capistrano for asking me to speak, uh, as well as Cheryl Cambe from the Meadows in the back there. Um, it's a real honor to be here. Um, this is a long lecture time, <laughs> meaning it's uh, two hours. Uh, of talking on my part. So uh, you'll probably be really sick of me and my voice by the end of this. Um, I'll try to keep things uh, relatively entertaining and um, we will we'll have a break in the middle. So, um, okay. All right, so let's get started. Um, so this is me in this region <laughs> right there. Um, so uh, I uh, am the founder and medical director of the UCLA Dual Diagnosis Program. Uh, this is uh, an outpatient program. It's nice, it's in network, which is often difficult to find. Uh, and also the founder and medical director of the Camden Center, not in network, uh, that's a primary uh, mental health and dual diagnosis program. So if you have questions about those, Find me afterward. We just got new business cards yesterday. They're pretty awesome, so come find me afterward. I got a bunch in my pocket. I really want to give them out. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, disclosures, no conflicts of interest. Learning objectives for uh, this talk uh, is to understand trauma as a primary etiology of addictive disorders, uh, to learn to screen for uh, trauma a history of trauma, specifically uh, when doing assessments of individuals with addictive disorders, um, and know um, what the 
uh, both evidence-based and um, evidence-supported uh, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies are for individuals with dual diagnosis. So, okay. All right, so before we get into the, the um, heart of this lecture, um, I think it's really important for us to define terms. So um, addiction is one of those words uh, where we use it um, and everybody thinks that we know what we mean and when we say the word and to somebody else, we think they know what we mean uh, and that we're all operating with the same um, definition. But addiction is actually a um, very poorly defined uh, concept and um, and in in terms of the people who uh, are the the field that's responsible or that everybody looks to for a definition, actually, um, the there there's quite a bit of disagreement actually about specifically what um, addiction is. So much so that um, the uh, the committee that writes the DSM very fastidiously tries to avoid using the word. Um, so in the DSM-4, if you guys remember, uh, they didn't, you know, the, the terms that were used were substance abuse and substance dependence, which is a very artificial distinction between those. Now um, the, the terminology that's used, the diagnostic terminology, are substance use disorders. There is a larger category within the DSM-5 uh, that is the, uh, the category of addictive disorders, um, which basically just includes the substance use disorders and then pathological gambling. Um, but so far, nobody's been able to get comfortable enough with the word addiction in academia to put it in the DSM in any way where anybody actually gets diagnosed with something that has the word addiction in it. So, um, okay. So um, there are actually kind of, um, in my view, three um, different definitions or different lenses through which uh, addiction is viewed. Um, and uh, this is my terminology, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. But um, the, um, and, and I, I think the, the way to think of these three lenses is, you know, the empirical viewpoint, the neurologic viewpoint, and the processing viewpoint. By processing, I mean information processing, and I'll, I'll discuss, discuss each of these in a little more detail. So let's start with the empirical viewpoint. Um, so uh, this is the, um, what, this is the viewpoint that's used in the DSM. Um, so currently there are eight behavioral criteria one symptomatic criterion that's new for the DSM-5, that's the presence of cravings, um, and then two physiologic criteria, those are the development of tolerance and withdrawal. Is that Kurt Garby back there? Hey, Kurt! Oh, just saw him, what a pleasant surprise. Um, okay, uh, and uh, sorry for calling you out, just, uh, all right, um, and um, okay, so the advantage of, um, <laughs> the advantage of this way of looking at things uh, is that it's non-controversial and it's measurable. Um, now, these are great characteristics if you're an insurance company, right? So, um, and the reason is, is because insurance companies' job is to not pay for treatment, right? So, the deal is, is that if you're an insurance company, your revenue comes from taking people's premiums and your expenses are paying for people's medical care. And the difference between those things is your profit. So, um, you know, your job as a, an insurance company that's trying to maximize your profit is to get as much money as you can for the premiums and pay out as little money as you can. Um, now, you have to make it look like you are trying to do the right thing. Um, but essentially, you know, the, the, the DSM, even though it is um, a clinical document, um, really is so um, prominent in our culture, in our clinical culture, because of the payer system, right? It's really not that useful, in my opinion, to those of us that are actually trying to help people. Um, so, um, y you know, and, and, and by the way, I believe this goes for not just um, substance use disorders. I think this is true across the entire uh, DSM. Um, you know, schizophrenia, for example, is, you know, I guarantee you 
that there are at least 100 different things that are all being lumped together and called schizophrenia because they will meet diagnostic criteria for that. Um, so um, now, now the again, what's useful about this viewpoint is, like I said, it's very objective and it's measurable. Um, and it enables you to do things like um, fill out master treatment plans, um, you know, where you can say that the objective for treatment is that the patient's going to be able to identify at least two different means of coping with uncomfortable feelings and attend at least, you know, these sorts of things that are really vital to how people actually get better, right? Um, so, um, okay. Now, the disadvantage um, to, this, to this model um, is that it's agnostic with respect to the mechanism and the, and the etiology of addiction. And that's really important, right? So, um, because that's what, that, that, that's what enables us to provide a meaningful definition of what addiction is. And more importantly, you know, understanding what the mechanism and the cause, the etiology is of something particularly in mental health care, is what enables you to treat it, right? So, I mean, other areas of healthcare, this, this, this is maybe a little bit less true for, right? So if somebody comes in with a broken arm, it doesn't really matter whether they broke their arm because they got hit by a car or they broke their arm because they fell off of a chair. The treatment for the broken arm is basically the same. Um, that's really not true in mental health care. It's, it's, it's vitally important for the treatment uh, to know why and how the person got to the place where they have the symptoms that you are looking at, right? So two people can be addicts, two people can have be in a major depressive episode, and if that's all you know, right, that they have five of nine criteria for a major depressive episode and they have seven of however many criteria, I guess, uh, um, 11 criteria for an addictive disorder, that doesn't really help you in terms of formulating a, a treatment plan for them that's likely to be effective, right? You have to know, well, why is it that they started using? Why is it that this person's in a major depressive episode, right? Um, and and so um, I, I do think that unfortunately, the what's good for the insur you know the payer system has kind of trumped what is good for the patients in terms of the the means by which we all talk to one another about these diagnoses and this is sort of the whoops this is the predominant way in which we 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 create diagnoses now all right now here's sort of uh, something on um, a different from a different angle um, this is another way in which people are more and more frequently talking about addiction. Um, I think there is some utility in this. Um, I do, however, think that um, there is a fundamental human wish to understand and simplify psychological issues uh, and make them things that are much more concrete and easier to understand. And um, and and I think that that the the um, psychiatric research world and that part of human nature are colluding right now to uh, create these um, neurologic definitions of things. And, you know, there's, there's all sorts of centers you can go to now and get spec scans and fMRIs and they'll give you pretty pictures and, and um, tell you, well, this part of your brain is lighting up and this part of your brain's not lighting up and therefore, what? Okay, great. <laughs> so um, I, I, I um, you know, I, I think we're making progress. Um, my personal opinion is that I don't think we're likely to ever have a more effective means of affecting the type of change in another person that um, is the type of change that needs to happen in order for them to heal from mental health care issues. We'll never have a more effective tool than a human being talking to that person. Um, you know, I don't think we're ever going to be able to put somebody in a machine and have them, you know, you know, oscillate a magnet really quickly and induce an electrical charge in their brain and fix the problem. That's what TMS is. Um, so, um, okay. So, but let's look at what um, let's look at what this perspective um, says about addiction. Well, when you go to um, residency for psychiatry and you have your your course on addiction, the thing that you hear is that um, the final common pathway for all addictive issues um, is the ventral tegmental area, the VTA, 
to the nucleus accumbens, right? So that's a dopaminergic pathway. There's some neurons in your ventral tegmental area. They're, they make dopamine um, and they project, sorry, that seems to happen every time I say a P. P, P, P. Okay. Um, so, I'll try to avoid words that start with P for the rest of the lecture. <laughs> May not be as clear. <laughs> Ease, forgive me. Just kidding. That's really getting bad up here. I got to fill up time here. I don't think I have enough slides to do the whole two hours. So the quality, this may vary. Um, so, um, okay, so, so the, um, the ventral tegmental area, it's an it's a area that has uh, um, dopaminergic neurons. They project, this is in the midbrain, they project to uh, an area called the nucleus accumbens, which is in your limbic system. Um, and that is the reward pathway. I'll have a lot more to say about that later in the lecture. But essentially, all what we've known for a long time is that all um, addictive disorders end up being mediated by this pathway. Okay. I can, not on that brain, um, which, in case you're wondering, is a non-copyrighted picture of the brain. Um, the, um, th it's coming next, so. Um, but, well, it's sort of right under there, right? So that's your cerebellum right there in the back, and um, so up in there is your midbrain, and um, the, that pro that's the ventral tegmental area, and it projects over to the nucleus accumbens, which if you go underneath the cortex, which is the squiggly part on the outside, it's right underneath there. Okay. Um, okay. So, so what we know um, about uh, the neurobiology of addiction is that... Um, there are abnormal, abnormalities in, you know, if you look at an addicted brain and you look at a non-addicted brain, the addicted brain has abnormalities in dopaminergic neurotransmission in the following areas. The ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, the prefrontal cortex, which is up here, um, and the anterior cingulate gyrus, which is right around here. Um, so um, now, the neuro, this is stuff that we have figured out through neuroimaging, um, and the two types of neuroimaging are fMRI, functional MRI, that enables you to put somebody in an, an this, you put somebody in a machine, you ask them to think about different things or do different things, and it tells you which areas of the brain are consuming more oxygen, ostensibly indicating where you're thinking harder. Um, and the, um, this is what they love to do at the Amund Center, um, and just, controversial topic that I'll keep my mouth shut on. So um, the um, uh, SPECT and PET scanning is uh, when you inject somebody with what's called a, um, a radio tracer um, and or a radio ligand in this case. Um, and what that is is, you know, so you attach something that emits um, radioactivity, uh, you attach it to something that fits into a particular receptor, let's say in this case the dopamine receptor, and then you put them into a machine and the amount of binding of that um, radio ligand to the um, dopamine receptors indicates how many other things are in those receptors and you can make inferences then about how much activity is there. So those are the those are when you see pretty pictures of brains that um, have different things lighting up, that's what that comes from. Now, the advantage of this approach is that you get really interesting and pretty pictures, right? So it's I mean this is fascinating stuff. I mean it really is. I mean from a from an intellectual standpoint, um, I think it's amazing that humans have figured out how to do this, right? I mean it's it's really unbelievable and. I do think that this is really, you know, this is this is this is the, the we're on the path to understanding more and more um, about how the brain works um, uh, through these techniques. The issue, though, is just that you know what is it that that you're trying to do? If you're trying to provide clinical care to people, I don't know how much utility they have at the moment. So this is what I like to say about it. So because people will often ask me about whether they should get neuroimaging done. And so the disadvantage is it has limited to zero clinical um, relevance. Um, and the thing that I liken it to is, is like 
taking, like let's say, so our brains are computers. Our brains are biological computers. And if you have a computer, if your laptop isn't working right, it's got a bug in it, right? Like every time you open up Microsoft Word, it crashes, right? This is like taking your laptop computer to the guy at the computer store and saying, hey, every time I open up Microsoft Word, it crashes, I don't know what's wrong with it. And then he puts it in a machine and he says, okay, well over this one area right here, this chip, we see there's more electrical activity there. Okay, here you go, right? So, um, right? So, so and the, the reality is, is that um, we can understand on a physical level everything there is to know about what's going on in the brain but you know what matters is our thoughts and emotions right and and the, our thoughts and emotions are information there it's information that is encoded in the physical substrate in the same way that your you know the you know your the, uh, uh, you know in Microsoft Word document that you wrote that's sitting on your computer is encoded in it's on, it's on your hard drive in there, right? It's, it's encoded in little switches, little silicon switches on or off, right? Um, but, you know, knowing everything that you, there is to know about the silicon tells you nothing about whether there's grammatical errors in the paper that you wrote, right? So, okay. And I really think that actually is a very accurate and powerful analogy to sort of where we are right now um, in the progression of uh, the field of mental health care. One of the things I like to say is that mental health care is kind of like where the Greeks were with physics, right? So they had figured some stuff out, but they, you know, they said, okay, everything's made up of either water, land, fire, or wind, right? Uh, and that framework enabled them to, you know, figure out some things, but they, you know, they, they didn't have an accurate enough or, or a, a fine-grained enough understanding of things to really, you know, do things like we can do now, like, you know, build cars and things like that. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> this is why I think the right and most useful way to understand not only addiction, but I think actually pretty much everything related to mental health care is from a, an information processing perspective, right? Meaning, you know, yes, our brains are where all of this is happening, but they are the physical substrate of what we care about, which is our thoughts and our feelings, right? And what I was getting at w by saying that we're at, you know, we're, we're at in mental health care where the Greeks were with physics is that until we know what consciousness is, right? Until we understand like what are thoughts and feelings, we're not really going to be able to say much more. Um, you know, we're, we're relegated to talking about um, the physical substrate, but it's important to be very clear that your neurons are not your thoughts, right? They are the physical substrate of your, they're a machine that is generating through what I believe to be a process of, of neuronal oscillations, it's another whole topic, but they, it's a machine that is generating your thoughts and encoding information in a physical substrate. Okay, um, <clears throat> so, this is a picture of a book that I like. It's called Society of Mind. Um, it's written by a guy named Marvin Minsky, who, who died a couple of years ago. He was a professor at MIT. Um, he is one of the, he was, was one of the um, uh, sort of forefathers of the modern cognitive science movement. Um, it's an interesting book. Um, the, the, you don't have to read it. I'll tell you the important part right now. <laughs> um, the, um, sorry, Marvin. Um, or Marvin's estate. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, we'll get back from that. So, so, so basically the idea of society of mind is that even though humans feel, we feel like we are a cohesive singular entity, what we really are is a whole bunch of discrete cognitive modules, each doing only one thing and caring and knowing nothing about anything else, that are all kind of connected together and overseen by a, another very special module, which is the executive module. Um, and the executive module listens to what the desires are of each of the sub modules and mediates between them what you're gonna do with your singular body, right? Um, and I'll talk more about this in a second. So from this perspective, what addiction is, is essentially it's the escape 
of the reward system from the executive, which is pre your executive lives in your prefrontal cortex, right? Um, so so um, as I will talk about, I think, in the subsequent slide, um, <clears throat> The role of your executive, like I've got two young kids, so it's a, I definitely know this role. It's it, the role of the executive is primarily to say no, <laughs> right? Um, the role of the executive is it, it, there, there's a term in um, uh, in neurology. It's called prefrontal inhibition. Your your the, the 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 neurons that leave your prefrontal cortex basically go all throughout your brain, and they are inhibitory neurons because basically. What the role of your prefrontal cortex is, is to get all that information and then say, okay, no, 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 okay, yes, we'll do that one thing now, right? Um, and what addiction is, and I think this is really the meaningful way to explain what addiction is, not through a cluster of symptoms or, or through a def, you know, pointing to specific neurologic structures. I think the meaningful way to explain what addiction is, is that one of those modules has gotten so powerful and out of balance that it has escaped control of the, of the executive. It has staged a mutiny and, you know, it's like your 11 year old getting on steroids and saying, you know what, dad, I'm going to have candy for dinner, right? And he's now buff enough that that's what's going to happen, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, <clears throat> all right. Um, fortunately for me, my 11-year-old has my genes. That's definitely not going to happen, either now nor later. Um, so, um, okay. So, uh, the disadvantage of this approach um, is that it's completely non-empirical, right? You don't, and, the, and you don't want your system to be non-empirical. And empir empiricism is the only way that you mediate disagreements in theories, right? If you don't have recourse to data and say, well, let's do an experiment, then you, you then anybody can say whatever they want, and nobody can really disagree with them. So that's the problem with framing things this way. Um, but the advantage, oops. The advantage is that it specifies the mechanism and, as I was just saying, allows us to provide a meaningful definition of addiction. And by the way, that's what our patients and their families want, right? So when our patients and families come to us and are like, why is this happening? And by the way, you know, those of us here that are in recovery will know that it is often just as baffling to us why we use repeatedly in context where we shouldn't, as it is to everybody else, right? So everybody asks the addict, why did you relapse? Why did you stop, you know, why did you stop going to meetings? And why did you, or whatever it was that you stopped doing, and, and, and why did you relapse? And the addict literally doesn't have any better idea than you do, or, you know, or his or her mom does, right? So, um, so when they come to us, they want an explanation as to like, what is happening? Why is this happening? And unfortunately, giving them symptoms from the DSM or explaining to them that there's a part of their brain called the ventral tegmental area that projects to the nucleus accumbens and that part is having more activity than it would otherwise in people with non-addicted brains, that is totally useless and meaningless to them, right? But this perspective enables you to provide a meaningful explanation and it informs what is, what is likely to work and not work for treatment. Okay, so um, this is another um, non-copyrighted image. I apologize. I didn't feel like figuring out how to use copyrighted images in my lecture, so I just had to find like clip art, basically. Um, uh, so this is that. Um, but basically, this is a representation of what Marvin Minsky was talking about uh, in, term, in, in, in the book Society of Mind. Okay. So let's say this is the executive, right? And each of these are one of the modules in our brain. And by the way, something that's really important to know that I think people assume isn't the case is that our brains are almost identical to one another. So we're humans, and so we're incredibly focused on the differences between us. But you know, in the same way that we all look different from one another, and because our brains evolved to be very sensitive to the differences, we can recognize, you know, you never meet two people unless they're identical twins who look exactly the same. The reality is we all have a face, and it has two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, and two ears, right? It's the same thing with our brain, right? So I know when you see a picture of a brain, it just looks like a bunch of random squiggliness up there, 
but it's the same squiggles in everybody's head, right? Everybody's brain has exactly the same parts wired together in exactly the same way. And the difference between us in terms of the way that some of those parts may be a little stronger than other parts. And, you know, that's like the difference between our faces, right? So the differences between our personalities and, and, and our intelligence and all the other things that are mediated by our brain, that's the same way in which we look differently from one another. But, but we're all made up of the same parts. Okay. So, and you know, to a dog, we all look identical, right? So dogs are, I mean, it's, if you want to do an interesting experiment, um, uh, go get a magazine cover that has a picture of a face on it and turn it upside down um, and see if you can identify, you know, if, have it be a famous person and see if you can identify who it is when you turn it upside down. You won't, you typically aren't able to identify them. And the reason is, is because the, we have a special module in our brain. In fact, actually it's one of these guys whose only job is to identify faces. Um, and it is like an exquisitely complicated and sensitive computer, and it only works when it identifies something as a face and everything's in the right order. So if it's upside down, you do, that, that module doesn't get turned on. And so if you want to get a feeling for what we look like to every other animal in the world, except for humans, just look at a magazine face turned upside down. It's fun. It's not that much fun. It'll be fun for a few minutes or a few seconds. Um, okay, so um, the... Um, so, so each of these are one of our modules, and you know. So, for example, you know, all of us have a module in our brain whose only job is to monitor our bladder, right, and see how full how full is our bladder, right? It doesn't. That's all it does. It knows nothing of anything else in the world except for your your bladder and how full it is. It doesn't even understand words, and. Um, when your bladder's not that full, it's just at the table and it's quiet. So it's kind of be okay. No, all right, no problem, right? So there's no. It's 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 very easily overruled when your bladder's not full. Um, but as your bladder gets fuller and fuller, this guy or girl starts becoming more and more assertive, right? And what is in front of each of these guys or girls is a button that they use to make their voice heard. And what that button does is it makes you experience a sensation, right? So, um, or a feeling, right? So the button in front of this, in front of this one is, is the one that makes you feel like you have to pee. Um, so as this gets, your bladder gets fuller and fuller, this guy's pushing the button harder and harder and harder. And now, as I mentioned though, the thing that's really important is this one, this, this person, the executive, has greater power to overrule than any of these subordinates have to influence you to do something. And that's really important, right? So I could have to pee, like let's say I'd forgotten to go to bath the bathroom before I came up here and I, you know, I had a triple latte this morning, um, that, that part's true, um, and, um, and I had to pee really bad then you know this guy might be pushing his button and going hey let's let's go to the bathroom right now let's pee right now and then but there'd be another one here that might be like my you know the part of my brain that, that processes embarrassment or social issues and saying no if you pee while you're giving a lecture that's gonna be really embarrassing <laughs> right um and then you know this is like the part of me that's concerned about my career and advancement <laughs> right and he's like yeah i agree with this guy you know and so th these guys are like yeah Forget it, Bob. And it's like, and then, but he keeps pushing the button and these guys are pushing their buttons, right? And then it's ultimately up to this guy though to decide what we're gonna do, right? It's ultimately up to the executive. And the, the deal is, is that, you know, if, if somebody were to hold a gun to your head and say, listen, if you pee, I'm gonna shoot you, you could probably hold your pee until your bladder exploded, right? And the, the, the reason is, is because evolution made our brains so that the boss, the one who controls your limbs and everything, is the has veto power over everyone else. Okay, um, and you know what's interesting is that once you understand this perspective, actually, just reflecting on your own life, it it makes sense of a lot of things that are otherwise, I think, difficult to understand. Right. So, for example, we all have a module that mediates our anger. All that that module does is literally it scans all of the thoughts that are coming in, all of the perception of what's happening. 
whether you're either experiencing live or remembering or thinking about, and it just scans it for, am I being disrespected, right? And it just waits. And if you're not being, if, it, if, if, if the scene that you're thinking about or, or, or involved in doesn't involve you being disrespected, then this guy is not pushing his button. There's nothing for him or her to say. But if you interpret something as being disrespectful, then, you know, starts pushing the button. And the thing that's important to understand is your anger is not you. It's just part of you. But this is the reason why, for example, you know, I might be driving and somebody might cut me off and I'll have a thought to myself, you know, I should follow them home and kill their family. <laughs> um, that's actually a thought I've had before. I've, I have a hatchet at my house, a small one that could fit in, my, in the center console of my car. I've actually thought to myself, fuck, I wish I had that hatchet with me and I could just hold it up and look at the person. <laughs> Not do anything, but just look at them and hold the hatchet. Because me just staring at them at the red light is not intimidating enough. Um, so, so the thing is, is that, you know, I'm, look, I am not violent. You know, I, um, you know, being a Jew, having gone through puberty a little late, that violence was not an option for me as a means of resolving issues as I was developing, right? So um, uh, the, the, we're not a rugged people. Um, so, so, but the thing is, is that my anger module is, mur is murderous, and so is all of your anger modules, right? All your anger module wants to do is murder and torture people who disrespect you in any way whatsoever. Your, 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 your anger module does not have any moderation, right? What ha where the moderation comes from is this guy. Whoops, is this guy right here, right? So the anger module is like, yeah, follow them home and kill their family. And this guy, the career guy is like, nope. This guy is maybe your ethical, you know, the, the part of you that's compassion. They're like, nope. This one is the one that doesn't want to go to jail. That says, nope. Right? The, the, and so your anger module quickly gets overruled, right? Um, and, you know, people who have anger management problems, it's not that their anger module is really any different than the rest of our anger modules. It's just that the relative strength of that voice compared to the other modules and the relative strength of it compared to the strength of the executive, um, you know, is just higher. Right? So, and, and so, like I was saying, you know, we all have faces with two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, but we all look differently. You know, the, the reality is, is that that's just the equivalent, for example, of you know, somebody having a bigger nose and you know, brown eyes as opposed to a smaller nose and green eyes. Right? Um, okay. Here's the picture. Okay. Um, so this is, your, this is what's called a sagittal cross-section. Um, meaning if you cut somebody in half like this and peel off the outside part. Um, so here are the, the regions that we were talking about. It's the prefrontal cortex. This is the ventral tegmental area. This is the nucleus accumbens. This is the amygdala that's irrelevant for this, but it was on the slide. So you can ignore that. Um, okay. So <clears throat> this is also a massive oversimplification. So anybody who's like, that's an oversimplification. It's an, it, it is, but it's, it's, it's um, sufficient for this talk. Um, okay, so this is the, this pathway, the one I was describing, ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens, that's called the mesolimbic pathway, right? Because meso is middle, it's in your middle brain, and this, the, the, ventral, the uh, nucleus accumbens is part of the limbic area, so you put them together and you get mesolimbic. Um, that's, that is go. That's, that's, that is the, that's the reward pathway. It's what mediates our drives, all of our drives, okay? As I mentioned, the, the prefrontal cortex is where the executive lives, and the executive's job, by and large, is to say no, right? So, um, so the executive, <coughs> um, this part of the brain projects actually also to the ventral tegmental area, as well as m almost every other part of the brain, and it says stop. 
OK, so let's, let's look at what happens here. All right, so let's just give your prefrontal cortex um, arbitrarily a power of 10, right? That's its ability to inhibit, that's the strength of its inhibitory power. Okay. Now let's look at the strength of the reward of the drive for various different modules, right? So you have a module that's your drive for food, a module that's your drive for water, a module that's your drive for sex, a module that's your drive for cocaine if you have done cocaine and liked it. Um, so, um, now, importantly, let's just look at these first three here. Um, the, um, by the way, this is like the max power, meaning like when you are your hungriest, let's say, and by the way, I just made up these numbers. This is just an example. But, um, but when you're your hungriest, this may have a power of three. And so what I mean by that is it doesn't really matter how hungry you are. You're always going to be able to inhibit yourself from eating if you really want to. Okay. Um, so all of these rewards have something in common that is different from cocaine. They are all natural rewards. When I, mean, when I say natural, what I mean, I don't mean organic, what I mean is, is that they were all rewards that existed in the environment that we evolved in, right? So evolution has, ha and, and by the way, this part of our brain evolved when we shared a common ancestor with mice, right? So this isn't even like human evolution. I'm talking about way back. So, um, you know, evolution has had millions of years to fine tune the strength, the relative strength of your drive for food, your drive for water, your drive for sex, um, and make sure that it was less than your prefrontal inhibitory power, right? Because if it wasn't, you know, and your drive for water had a maximum power of 13, that when you got thirsty, all you would do is just sit and drink water all day, right? And if your drive for sex was that high, all you would do is stay home and masturbate all day. And you never, you know, which, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, isn't, you know, reproduction the most important thing evolutionarily? No, it's, I mean, it, it reproducing is what's most important. And sex is just sort of the end part of that. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that leads up to that, that, you know, you, if you don't survive up to puberty, then that doesn't get to happen. Um, so, um, okay, and some of you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, don't people get addicted to, to sex and, and food? And the answer is yes, but people aren't getting addicted to the type of sex and food that existed in the environment that we evolved in, right? Nobody's getting addicted to monogamous sex with their spouse, right? Nobody's getting addicted to, um, you know, salad without salad dressing, right? <laughs> um, so now, conversely, cocaine, Cocaine didn't, I mean, it existed in the coca leaf as, a, as an insecticide, basically, for that plant. But humans weren't doing cocaine at this point. And so, and they sure as hell weren't doing it in its really addictive forms, which is when you extract it and are able to um, take it intranasally or inject it or, or, or smoke it as a free base. Um, so the problem is that cocaine if it's your drug of choice, is so rewarding, is so, en is so enjoyable, that you end up developing a strength of your drive for it that exceeds the strength of your prefrontal cortex to inhibit it, right? So the second somebody who does cocaine drive for that coke, and by the way, it doesn't happen the first time, right? You know, as soon as somebody has done cocaine enough times, that their drive for it has exceeded in this model 10, in my opinion, that is the point at which they have now have a cocaine addiction, right? So do you see what I mean by this is a meaningful way to talk about what addiction is, right? This is, explains what's going on because by the way, that may have happened and that person's life may look totally fine at that point. They may not be in any trouble yet. Um, so all of those symptoms that are in the DSM, they're not gonna meet any of those criteria for an addictive disorder. And yet what I would argue is that that is the, the, the moment this hits 11, that is the crucial moment that the person, and, and unfortunately it looks like once that happens, there's no coming back from that. Um, that is the, per, the point at which that person became a cocaine addict not the point at which their kids got taken away, not the point at which they lost their home, not the point at which they started having health problems. 
in my opinion, the, the point at which they had addiction is when their reward system as being used for their drive for cocaine exceeded their ability, the ability of their prefrontal cortex to inhibit it, right? Prior to that point, you know, say the person really likes coke, but they haven't gotten addicted to it yet, you know, they'll go to a party and somebody will have coke and say, hey, do you wanna do some coke? And they'll say, ah, oh, you know what? It's my kid's birthday tomorrow. And I told him that I would pick him up at seven o'clock and we were gonna go to Disneyland. Um, so I'm not gonna do the coke, right? So the, there, was, there was another, there was, there was the cocaine guy at the table and there was some other people at the table that were like, ah, let's not do coke because there's, there, you know, net, this isn't a good idea. And at that point, the executive goes, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, no, no, we're, we're not gonna do the coke. We got our kid's birthday tomorrow. The point at which this is 11 or greater, the cocaine module says, hey, let's do the coke. And everybody else at the table goes, dude, no way, let's not do the coke, it's our kid's birthday tomorrow. Um, and the cocaine guy says, oh, let's do the coke. Uh, and the executive says, no, 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 no. But the problem is, is that the executive has lost, can, no longer can inhibit the drive to do the cocaine. And so the person does the cocaine. And then the next day when they've come down and all of the adverse consequences from that decision are there and everybody is asking them, what the hell, man? Why would you do Coke when you knew it was your kid's birthday the next day? And guess what? They have no idea. <laughs> because when you're talking to a person, you're basically talking with their executive. The executive didn't make that decision. It was just their drive for cocaine that made that decision. And the problem is because they got exposed enough to cocaine and they liked it enough, their drive for it exceeded the ability of their executive to inhibit it. So. Okay, and as I'm sure you can piece together, once this change happens, it's just a matter of time until the outward manifestations of addiction start to come to fruition, right? Okay. Did I start at 9.30 or nine? Ah, so it's an hour right now. This would be a natural place for me to take a break. Okay, so well, questions. Should, yeah, no? yeah. So why don't we do questions, and then uh, muffins or whatever, and then I'll, and then I'll do the second half. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask um, if cranial sacral therapy or any other manipulative form of treatment like lasers or whatnot. Would that alleviate the physical abnormalities found in spec scans? Um, so the short answer is no. Um, and you know, really what the longer answer is, is that again, you know, the spec scan just reflects whatever, like it's way, the only information that the spec scan is gonna give you is literally information that you could get from the person by asking them, for example, do you still have cravings, right? Um, you know, are, are, are you, you know, um, still thinking all the time about using? Um, that, so so I, I do think that the more nuanced answer is that any treatment that is beneficial for the person in their healing will also result in changes that you see in the spec scan, but that's because the spec scan, like words, is just another way of finding out what's going in the brain. Dr. Shepard, you know, I think there was a miscommunication between the break and the questions, so. Oh, okay. Everybody would just wait about five minutes for questions, and then we'll take a break, a full break, so. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate on what you said about once you get to that point where you're addicted and it exceeds the ability to inhibit that you can never go back? Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, so this is one point that, you know, uh, so addiction is a very contentious field. People tend to disagree about almost everything. One of the things that almost everybody agrees with is that once somebody has developed an addiction to something, they have lost the ability to um, engage in that behavior non-addictively, right? So that may not be the case for, and this, this starts moving us into more controversial waters, that may not be the case for all um, addictive behaviors, meaning if somebody gets addicted to X, it's not the case that therefore they are unable to use 
to engage in some other addictive behavior non-addictively. I got it, this is getting complicated. What I mean is it's, it's, it may be the case that an alcoholic, for example, can gamble without becoming a pathological gambler. Um, although certainly it is substantially increased risk for becoming so. What appears to be the case is that <clears throat> um, the way that we learn, so it looks like the brain never actually really forgets anything. It's just that what, the less you use something, the more that that, uh, the, the farther that um, programming is from your consciousness. So it becomes progressively more inhibited. The, the best example of this is learning how to ride, like riding a bike, right? So you learn how to ride a bike when you're 10. Let's say you don't ride a bike again for 20 years. When you hop back on the bike, within you know, a couple hours, you're riding a bike just like you were before. So what, that, what it's like is that information about how to ride a bike is stored in your brain. It's not right there at your fingertips. But as soon as you hop back on a bike, that information starts being accessed. It's like opening up that file again. The way that people, it looks like, get sober is they abstain from using long enough, among other things that I'll get into, that the file gets more and more sort of deep down in the folders, you know, to use the computer analogy, but that it's there in all, with all of its power and in its full form. It's just not sort of, um, the files is not active and open. But the second that you take a drink, if you're an alcoholic, even if it's 20 years later, now you've basically opened up that file again, and what is consistent with all, essentially anybody who's in recovery's experience is that you can have somebody who's an alcoholic who's sober for 20, 30 years, and if they start drinking again, it's usually just a matter of a few months before they're back to exactly as bad as they were previously. Well, let's take a 10-minute break. Okay. So we'll be back here at 10 after, and we'll get going. Thanks, and I'd like to introduce, as I mentioned earlier, we partner in this uh, series with the Meadows, and let Cheryl Camby tell you a little bit about what's uh, new and current there. Thank you, Dr. Albert. Thanks again for being here. We're really happy to be a co-sponsor for this event this year. My name is Cheryl Cambay. I'm the local Los Angeles based representative for the Meadows Treatment Centers in Arizona. Just a short bit on the Meadows. We've been around over 40 years treating trauma, addiction, codependency, inpatient level of care. Our model was developed by Pia Melody over 35 years ago. She is still a senior fellow at the Meadows, so we're happy to be working with her. Our other senior fellows and consultants include Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, Peter Levine, Alex Katahakis, um, Patrick Carnes, and, and Dr. Stephanie Carnes as well. Um, outside of the inpatient programs at the Meadows, we have specific specialty inpatient programs. Remuda Ranch is our eating disorder program inpatient for women and young girls, um, primary eating disorders. We also have the Claudia Black Center, which it was developed by Dr. Claudia Black. It is a young adult program inpatient, ages 18 to 26. And then we have two gender-specific sex, love, and relationship addiction programs inpatient. Men's program is Gentle Path at the Meadows, where Dr. Carnes works. He founded that program. And then his daughter, Dr. Stephanie Carnes, works at the Willow House program, which is a new women's program. We just opened it in March for women dealing with intimacy disorders, relationship issues. All of our programs across the board do treat co-occurring substance abuse, mental health issues. We're licensed duly in all of our inpatient programs, psychiatric, hospital level of care, as well as RTC, residential. Um, outside of our inpatient programs, we have the Rio Retreat Center, which is a separate facility. We offer over 15 different five-day uh, therapeutic intensives, trauma, sex addiction, couples work. Um, I have brochures in the back about that. In our inpatient program at the Meadows, we're also in network with TRICARE. About 20% of our business is active duty military and um, dependents and veterans. We're happy to be part of that. If you have any questions, please let me know. I have materials in the back as well as um, a display of books from a lot of our senior fellows. And I'd love to speak to you about more about our programs as well as know more about you and the resources in our community. So thank you again for being here. We look forward to seeing you again in the next one. And thanks, Dr. Schiffman, Jason, for being here with us. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Schiffman, let's, thank you. Okay, so um, this ends at 11.30, correct? Okay. Okay, so um, picking up sort of where we left off. Um, so as I mentioned um, uh, at the beginning, I'm the, I, I started the dual diagnosis program uh, at UCLA. And um, 
you know, the reason I, I, um, I started that program was because when I, um, when I went through the residency program at UCLA, the only, uh, the only uh, addiction uh, focused um, uh, clinic that they had there was the addiction medicine clinic, which was, and still is a, a medication management only clinic. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm in recovery myself, so I actually kept feeling like I was on candy camera when I was there because, um, you know, patients would come in off of a very long wait list to be there and, you know, they would say, okay, well, you know, I've been, I've been up for two weeks on meth, I'm living with an abusive boyfriend, I've got severe childhood sexual trauma, um, you know, and then the, the doc would say, okay, well, we're gonna start you on some Wellbutrin and we will see you back in two months. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, and, and the, 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 you know, my, my opinion, and again, you know, a lot of what happens in addiction, um, unfortunately, still is kind of opinion mediated because, uh, you know, the field is young. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, this term, uh, dual diagnosis, um, it, it, it strikes me as odd that this is supposed to be the special case, right? So, I mean, m maybe with the exception of like the one alcoholic who ever existed in 1932 <laughs> who wasn't anxious and depressed and just <laughs> drank too much, I'm pretty sure every other person with addiction is dual diagnosis, right? Um, and, and in fact, the premise of this lecture is that, um, uh, you know, primarily through means that have their origins in trauma, um, you know, ad addiction is just a solution that ends up becoming its own problem, right? And, um, and, and the thing is, is that it's a problem that has very visible symptoms um, and it's a problem that causes crises that involve other people. So, um, so therefore, it is the it's a problem that that lands people in treatment, and therefore, treatment has or you know treatment the treatment industry organizes uh, appropriately, but you know organizes itself around the things that people present for treatment for, right? So, um, you know, there's. If you, you know, there's, there's probably, for example, you know, I, I, there's probably no stores out there who just sell relish, right? <laughs> you know, but if you, you know, and the reason is because there's, you know, people don't usually think, fuck, I need relish, I'm gonna go to the store, right? Just, I'm gonna go get some awesome relish right now. Um, so, so, you know, stores are typically selling, you know, or, or organize themselves as things that people think they wanna go buy, right? So, you know, it's a sandwich, people want sandwiches, and so they're sandwich stores, and they, are primarily how relish gets distributed, unless. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so that's why um, the treatment industry, I think, again appropriately, you know, is, is organized the way that it is. But, um, but you know, in, in in my opinion, you know, the treatment of addiction is actually relatively straightforward, right? It's the, the addiction piece is not that complicated to treat. The, the part that's complicated um, and I think necessarily individualized is healing the piece that was that predated usually even the person's first use of the thing that they ended up getting addicted to, right? Because as soon as somebody stops using, the 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 the, the problems associated with using get better really fast, right? You know, if you're not drinking or using you know, six months from the time that you stop, most of the shit's probably been worked out, right? You've gone to your DUI class, your family's talking to you again, you got a job or whatever else. Um, uh, but the problem is, is that the minute that you stop, the person stops using, they have stopped, they've let go of what has been essentially their only tool to manage a very different, much longer standing, much more pernicious and very much less visible problem, which is the emotional distress that they were in that led, that got relieved when they were using. Um, and, you know, if, if 
unless that problem gets healed, the underlying problem gets healed, there's really only three options, right? So the person's either gonna relapse eventually, or uh, they're gonna kill themselves, or they're gonna live a long, miserable life, right? So no, and none of those three options are good options as far as I'm concerned. So, so in my mind, you know, I think that, you know, this, this little thing that now every treatment center says that they do, you know, co-occurring dual diagnosis, you know, that, that is sort of this side thing or, or traditionally has been this side thing. I, I actually think that the, the primary way, the primary thing that needs to be addressed and healed isn't actually the substance addictive part, right? I mean, like I said, clearly needs to be addressed and, 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 um, and there, you know, there, that needs treatment. But like I said, that is treatment that can be like manualized, right? I, my UCLA program, I have a manual. I wrote a manual, a CBT and mindfulness-based manual. It's like you can, tr you, can, you can write a manual about how to recover from addiction. Now, it's not going to be sufficient, right? You need more than just the manual. But what I mean is, you know, it's about things like learning what your triggers are, avoiding your triggers, you know, halt, hang, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, right? Um, you know, go to meetings, you know, all of these different things that, that, that are well-known things for people that people do in order to recover from the addiction part of addiction. But the problem is, is, you know, I kind of view addiction as like this lake that's got a hundred thousand different, you know, little streams going down to it. You know, each of those streams ends up at the same place, right? So that's the addiction. But the path that took you there is different typically for each person, including like what was the origin of that stream at the top of the hill, right? And if you really want to get all the way better, you have to heal that part. And guess what? That's different for each person, right? You know, the reason, you know, my dad being an asshole isn't the reason that you used, <laughs> right? So, um, so, so that's the, that's why the, the, um, I think that the psychological piece of dual diagnosis really is the fundamental thing that needs to be addressed in order for people to really get all the way better when they present for treatment. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> let's see what is next. Ah, okay. So this is something that I find um, interesting, which is that oftentimes people don't ask why things happen, right? And so you know, addict, a, a dual diagnosis is an addictive disorder and a co-occurring psychiatric disorder. But given how frequently these go together, isn't that noteworthy, right? So in other words, dual diagnosis mean, doesn't mean an addictive disorder and a co-occurring uh, GI problem, right? It doesn't mean a you know, dual diagnosis isn't, you know, an addictive disorder and co-occurring lymphoma, right? Like, oh yeah, pretty much every alcoholic has lymphoma. No, right? It's pretty much every alcoholic has depression, anxiety, or whatever. So, so why is that, right? When I said dual diagnosis, you knew what I was talking about, which, well, beside the fact that I had it up there, but <laughs> if had that not been up there, you would know that what I meant was an addictive disorder and a co-occurring psychiatric issue. So why is that the case? All right. To answer that question, we first just need to do a little bit of definition of terms here. So dual diagnosis patients have as their psychiatric disorder basically two different categories of conditions. One is what I'll call impulsivity disorders, and the other is egodystonic disorders. Now, in mental health care, we need to invent jargon for simple stuff because that's what enables us to fool everybody that we're doing something really scientific. Ego dystonic just means um, uncomfortable feelings, right? So these are, these are disorders that have symptoms that don't feel good. Impulsivity disorders is what they sound like, right? So the two impulsivity disorders that are ubiquitous in the substance using population are bipolar disorder and ADHD, right? I would say, that's a digression I don't need to go into. Okay, so um, uh, so very, very high prevalence of these two um, in, uh, in this population. Okay, I'm gonna say it. I think that it's an artificially high one with bipolar disorder. Every patient, almost every patient that comes to me has been diagnosed by somebody as having bipolar disorder. Um, I think probably about 5% of them have bipolar disorder. I do think it's higher in peop among people who have addictive disorders for reasons I'll explain, 
but it's not the close to 100% that, that I see. And I think really the reason for that is because whether somebody seems manic or not really depends on both them and you as the assessor. And I, you know, it's sort of like where you're standing. And you know, most psychiatrists are just kind of like nerdy boys and girls who did what their parents told them and like studied really hard and went to school. And so when they're talking to somebody who's like, yeah, I stayed up all night doing coke for three days and then had sex with a bunch of prostitutes and you know, then sold, uh, you know, sold my car to get more drugs, they're like, fuck, you're manic, right? <laughs> as opposed to that just sort of being like, a, you know, what most people do who end up in addiction treatment, right? So, um, so I, I, I do think that bipolar disorder tends to get massively overdiagnosed. So, um, and by the way, uh, yeah, I, that's, I, that's all I need to say about that. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, all right, and so for ego dystonic disorders, um, these are depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. These are the ones that have their origins in trauma, I believe. These ones are genetically mediated, right? Um, but it's just important to make that distinction because when people talk about dual diagnosis, these really are, f for different reasons that I'll explain now, these both are very much related to substance use disorders, but for totally different reasons. So it's important to make that distinction. Okay. All right, so back to, there's the picture again. Um, so back to this one. Um, all right, so this is the only slide I need to talk about the impulsivity disorders. So remember the power of 10 there. Now, when you're in a manic episode, the, the power of your prefrontal cortex to inhibit things goes from like a 10 to a two. That goes for all of your drives not just for drugs, right? So people, there's lots of people with bipolar disorder who don't have a drug problem, who when they're manic, just give in to every impulse. That's basically what mania is. Mania is giving in to every impulse that you have. If you're mad, you punch somebody in the face. If you feel like drinking, you go and drink. It doesn't matter if you're in the supermarket. If you, um, you know, if there's somebody you're sexually attracted to, you go up and tell them you want to have sex with them. If there's, um, if you want a boat, even though you've never been in the water before, you sell your house and go buy a boat. So, um, so that's what people do in manic episodes. Now, <clears throat> looking at the mechanism that I used before to sort of a, that processing perspective to explain what addiction is, it makes sense why people who are in who are bipolar and thus are having episodes of mania um, would be more likely to develop addictions right the threshold that any of these need to overcome in order to in order to uh, um, in order to 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 overcome their uh, the the inhibitory power of the executive is much much lower Right? And so people in manic episodes behave like addicts even if they're not addicted. Um, does that make sense? Okay, all right. So, um, and the same goes for you know, ADHD. Uh, basically what ADHD is, is it's just people who are born with, a, uh, with, with less prefrontal inhibition than others. Right? So in the same way that everybody has noses, but some noses are big and some noses are small, everybody has a prefrontal cortex with inhibitory power. Some people's prefrontal cortex got really strong inhibitory power and other people's is less. Um, and that's why the people who have less have difficulty with things when they're younger with hyperactivity because every impulse they have they go and do and then as they get older they have problems with concentration because they, the, the, when thoughts come into their head that isn't about what they're concentrating on, they have difficult times not indulging those thoughts. Um, and, and actually, you know, what's interesting is this is a dopaminergically me mediated thing. The more dopamine you actually have up here, um, the, um, the better, the more strength the inhibitory uh, power is of your, um, uh, of your prefrontal cortex. And that's why when people have ADHD, they get amphetamines typically. Um, okay. Except for when they're addicts, and then it's a huge issue that I'd have to deal with all the time, right? Because people come in and they've been on, you know, Adderall since they were nine, and then they got addicted to meth, and now they're off meth and they're back in school and they can't concentrate and they want to go back on Adderall, and and, and Stratera is 
uh, non-addictive um, uh, medication to use in that context. It doesn't work as well. We'll talk more about that later. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. Now, this is the interesting part of this lecture, um, which is um, egodystonic psychiatric disorders, right? So, <clears throat> this is where I think this is of the, of the two parts of dual diagnosis, the addictive part and the co-occurring psychiatric disorder part. This is what I think happens first. And this is what I think happens. So, depression and anxiety are not inherently pathological or bad emotions. Um, they are uncomfortable emotions, and none of us like them. But if something scary or dangerous is happening right now, the, it, it's healthy and appropriate and functional to be anxious. Right? If something sad or disappointing is happening right now, it is appropriate to have depressed mood. Right? And if you don't have those feelings under those circumstances, you actually have other problems that make you not functional. Right? So, um, you know, so, so, so anxiety and depression are the emotional equivalents of physical pain. Nobody likes physical pain, but we need it in order to survive. If we didn't experience some small amounts of physical pain, every day, we wouldn't actually be able to survive. I mean, the thing that makes you shift after you've been sitting in one position for a little while um, is pain that you're experiencing. And if you don't do that, you know, people who are in comas and don't shift around, they have to be turned by nurses every day so that they don't, their bones don't wear a hole through their skin. So, um, so it's the same with these uncomfortable feelings. But in the same way that pain when an injury is happening is not pathological, physical pain, uh, but chronic pain due to a back injury, right? So meaning pain when nothing, nothing bad is happening to you, that's pathological. It's the same with anxiety and depression, right? The, the, the problem is when somebody is experiencing anxiety all the time, even when nothing scary or dangerous is happening or feeling depressed mood all the time, even when something sad or disappointing isn't happening. Um, and that, the, the, that happens for a reason, right? That's not just like a mystery. Why is it that some people have chronic anxiety um, and depression? Um, you know, I think um, especially with sort of the division of labor in mental health care going the way that it has been with psychiatrists becoming just people who write prescriptions and then leaving therapy to everybody else, um, I think that it is unfortunately becoming more common for the explanation about why some people are chronically anxious and depressed to be, well, that's just because you have a neurochemical imbalance and what you need is Zoloft, right? Um, and while it is true that some of us are more sensitive and more anxiety prone than others in the same way that some of us have a lower threshold for physical pain than others, what is not true is that a person in a state of emotional health, you know, feels chronically anxious and depressed just because that's how they are genetically, right? That, that doesn't happen. There's a reason, there's a psychological reason why somebody experiences chronic um, anxiety and depression. And it's, in my opinion, because they have a sense of self that's rooted in shame, right? So guilt is feeling like you did something bad. Shame is feeling like you are something bad. Um, uh, I think of anger and shame as basically being the same emotion. It's just sort of which direction they're pointing, right? So if it's pointed outward, it's anger. If it's pointed inward, it's shame. Um, we all need a little bit of shame, right? I mean, we don't need a lot, just enough to not kill the families of people who cut you off in traffic <laughs> and, and to keep our pants on at the appropriate times, right? The, um, but that's, we, you know, just a little bit is enough. Um, and the, the deal is, is that, um, what it feels like to be you at any given moment walking around in the world um, really is determined in very, very strongly by your sense of self, meaning what is your self-image, right? So the same, and, and, and we get that self-image from the, m metaphorically, the mirroring that we get as we're developing. In the same way that you can't, you don't know what your face looks like until you look in a mirror, right? So. You have, you, we all have an idea about what we look like, and the way we know that, the way we have that model in our head is because we've looked in a bunch of mirrors. That's the only way that you can, you can figure that out. 
Well, it's the same thing with our sense of like, who are we as a person? Are we a good person? Are we a bad person? Are, are we lovable? Are people gonna abandon us? If, um, you know, a million questions like that. And we get answers to them through the interactions that we have primarily with our parents or caregivers as we're developing and then later our peers. Um, and we emerge from childhood as adults with a sense of self. And if that sense of self has a lot of shame in it, then we are chronically feeling like something dangerous or disappointing or sad is happening right now, even though it's not, right? Um, and that is why if you start digging a little bit beneath the surface, for basically everybody who has chronic anxiety and depression, what you'll find is, is that they, they, their sense of who they are is really rooted in shame. Um, and so, all right. Um, now, how does that happen? Shame is the universally experienced emotion that one experiences as a consequence of trauma. I mean trauma here not just as what's called big T or overt trauma. Those are things like being raped or witnessing a murder. Um, I also mean little t or covert trauma, developmental trauma, which is can be things like, you know, growing up in a chronically invalidating environment, right? You know, if, you know, you've got a dad because of his own limitations who, you know, is uh, incapable of expressing affirmation, um, but doesn't have that problem expressing anger, then what happens is, is that you grow up as a kid in that house only ever getting um, anger and never getting any affirmation. And it may not be the case, you know, it may not be the case that, you know, your, your dad ever hit you with a stick or put a cigarette butt out on you, but, but just every day of your life, never getting any affirmation and getting chronically um, shamed can, can be the type of trauma that will result in, in, in this. Um, okay, and the thing that is important is that once you get to here, you chronically don't feel good, right? And that is the place from which I believe almost everyone who develops an addictive disorder develops an addictive disorder. And I will explain now. Okay, so we're starting off with the psychiatric disorder. That psychiatric disorder is causing you to have chronic dysphoric affect, meaning most of the time when you're walking around in the world, you feel either anxious or depressed or shame, shame of some type. What happens then is you go to college and you drink like every normal college student does or you start or high school student or you, know, you, you hang out with your friends and like most normal kids do nowadays, you experiment with drugs and alcohol. And um, what you find is that that takes away that pain. And so what happens is, is that you start using that thing as a way to regulate your affect, right? It's medicine, except it's medicine that doesn't ever actually get rid of the, the thing that is causing the pain. It's just sort of like taking Tylenol when you've got the flu, right? You know, Tylenol doesn't do anything to get rid of the, the pathogen that's causing the flu, but it does make you feel better while you're taking it because it brings down you know, the fever um, and other uh, flu symptoms. And if you do this enough, what happens is you end up with an addictive disorder, right? And unfortunately, once you have an addictive disorder and you are um, using substances or engaging in addictive behavior, what happens is, is both for neurochemical reasons and for lifestyle reasons and relationship reasons, you actually end up doing things that very often go back and reinforce the underlying depression and anxiety. And now you have the situation where you are in a self-reinforcing cycle. Okay, all right. So, um, operant. This is the, so. So, how does that happen? How do we get from? How do we get from ac affect regulation to addiction? Right, And you can understand this through the principle of operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is just a type of learning. It's, um, it's, it's most commonly um, associated with Pavlov. Um, actually, you know what? You know, it's with Skinner, sorry. Um, oops, I just opened the CD case. Um, so, um, so operant conditioning is you know, when you, know, you, you, you have a rat and you're trying to get it to do a particular thing, right? 
um, but it applies to humans as well. And what happens in an addiction, you can, or what happens with, with um, in cases where somebody has chronic dysphoric affect and starts doing something that relieves them of that dysphoric affect, that is a setup where they essentially condition themselves into the point that they have in an addiction. And so that'll become more clear in a second. Let's start off with a norm, somebody who doesn't have chronic dysphoric affect, right? So this is somebody, let's say, who had a good enough childhood, no big T traumas, right? Um, so they engage in the rewarding behavior, try some Coke, right? And what happens? Euphoria, right? That's what happens when I do Coke. So um, the, uh, what happens after that? The Coke wears off. They go back to having stable affect. So that was the experience that that person just had. Now, from an operant conditioning perspective, they just experienced something called positive reinforcement for doing the cocaine. Positive reinforcement is when you do something and it results in a reward, right? Euphoria. Let's now compare this to the, op from an operant conditioning perspective, with somebody who has chronic dysphoric affect. So they engage in the rewarding behavior, the cocaine. The big difference here is they get euphoric relief, right? And that's a huge difference in terms of the, the um, conditioning, the type of learning, emotional learning that now happens for this person. So let's examine that. Well, first off, Oh, and then they go, I'm sorry, and then they go back from euphoric relief when the cocaine wears off back to having chronic dysphoric affect. Okay, so first of all, they get something called negative reinforcement, um, which didn't happen for the person who didn't have chronic dysphoric affect. Negative reinforcement is when you remove a painful stimulus. Right? So it's a way to get people to do something, right? It's a way you get a, a rat to do something, right? So if you want to try to get a rat to ring a bell, I don't know, whatever else you want to get a rat to do, do your homework, um, what you do, what, 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 the way you would do that through negative reinforcement is you would have a, let's say, uh, um, a, a little electrode on its tail that was constantly giving it a shock. And then when it did the thing you wanted it to do, you stopped the shock. Ugh, stop doing it. So it learns. Okay, if I do that, then the pain goes away. Okay, so chronic dysphoric affect just to feeling okay is negative reinforcement, right? Now, going from okay to feeling good is positive reinforcement. That's what the person over here experienced, right? Um, and now when the person makes the decision to stop doing cocaine and to come back down, they experience another type of operant conditioning called punishment, right? Punishment is what it sounds like. It's when, you, it's when you're trying to get somebody to not do something and it's when they do it and then they get an aversive stimulus, a bad stimulus, right? So put all together, if we compare what the experience of engaging in potentially addictive behavior, it, how, how that, what that looks like comparing somebody who isn't chronically anxious and depressed with somebody who is chronically anxiously, anxious and depressed, this one is only mildly um, incentivized, whereas this one is incredibly strongly incentivized. Right? Okay, I think that's gonna be on the next slide too. So, okay. So basically, because of the nature of how this works, the behavior, the addictive behavior is hyper incentivized in people who have chronic dysphoric affect or chronically anxious and depressed. And as I was saying in an earlier slide, people who've experienced trauma. Um, so operant conditioning results in repetitive engagement in this behavior, in this case doing cocaine, and consequent hyperactivation of the reward pathway, right? So that's how somebody goes from I'm anxious and depressed all the time to I tried Coke one time and it made me feel good. Okay, wait, I'm going to do that again and again and again and again and again and then ends up with an addiction to Coke, right? As opposed to someone who just at baseline feels okay, I tried Coke. Oh, it was fun. I'll do it again. Oh, I tried Coke. Okay, that was pretty good again. Let's keep doing it. Oh, wow. Negative consequences starting to pile up. I'm going to stop doing that, right? And doesn't go on to develop an addiction. 
Okay. So um, what's important to understand here about what is behind the reward pathway, it's really interesting. So people always think the reward pathway sounds good, right? Reward. Reward, the reward pathway does not mediate pleasure, right? The term, terminology actually that's it's interesting that's used in the academic literature about this is the difference between liking and wanting. So we tend to, in fact, almost always do end up wanting the things that we like. So it's actually kind of, can be kind of hard even in your mind to tease apart the difference between those two things. But what's interesting is um, if you think about it, liking is a pleasurable experience, right? Being on cocaine, if you like cocaine, feels good, right? Wanting is a dysphoric experience. Having a craving for cocaine and not doing it does not feel good, right? Um, <clears throat> so as I was saying, you know, the reward pathway doesn't mediate this, right? So. It, the reward pathway mediates this, right? The reward pathway is the thing that says, hey, think all the time about cocaine and feel really, really, really uncomfortable and agitated that you're not doing it right now. Um, and it's the thing that throws a tantrum when you decide that you're not going to do it. And for those of you who, who don't have an addiction history, I think one of the ways you can think about it is, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, being on a diet and going to a restaurant and, you know, having a salad or whatever you're having, and then they bring out the dessert table and there's like a huge, nice piece of your favorite chocolate cake right there, right? And, um, the decision not to have the chocolate cake is a painful decision, right? It doesn't feel good not to have the chocolate cake, right? Okay, um, so this is gonna start moving us into um, treatment. Uh, and um, one of the things that I always like to say to the patients in uh, my programs is that staying sober is really, really easy most of the time. It's just that it's almost impossible some of the time, right? And, and that's an important thing to get. Yeah? So, so, um, you know, so for example, using that chocolate cake analogy, um, you know, before, this, before the chocolate cake was wielded in front of you, it wasn't really that hard not having chocolate cake, right? So if you're just like driving around and there's no chocolate cake around, you're not like, oh, I need chocolate cake right now, right? Um, but as soon as there's chocolate cake in front of you, now it's really, really, really hard not to have that chocolate cake. Um, and, and, that's, and that's a craving, basically, right? And that's, the cravings are what mediate addiction. If, we didn't, if there was no cravings, people wouldn't need help getting sober, right? They would just, you know, be like, oh, well, I don't want to do this anymore, and they would stop doing it. Um, so, um, so that's an important thing to get just in terms of, you know, what needs to be addressed in treatment. It also, I think, is useful for families to know this because, and actually it's useful for, for healthcare practitioners to know this because I actually bafflingly find that a lot of psychiatrists will get mad at their drug addict patients because their drug addict patients, they think, lie to them and say, okay, I'm not going to use. And they say, okay, well, then I'll prescribe you the Valium if you promise me you're not going to drink, you know, and then... <laughs> And then they go and drink, right? And then the psychiatrist, you lied to me. Now I'm mad. Um, and, um, and, the, and the thing is, is that the reason that addicts, it's funny, I, addicts always get pegged as liars, right? And it is true that in order to maintain an actively using lifestyle, y you need to lie a lot of times, right? Um, but mostly because other people don't want you to be using. I don't think addicts, by and large, just by their nature, are any more inherent liars than anyone else. I think the reason that people think that is because even when addicts get sober, these things will happen where they'll tell their doctor, yeah, I promise I'm not gonna drink, and the doctor will write them for Valium, and then they'll leave and 15 minutes later be drinking. And they're like, oh, that guy's a pathological liar. He's a sociopath. You know, he just lied right to my face. You know, and, and the reality is, is that the, the alcoholic meant that he wasn't going to drink when you prescribed him the Valium, right? He wasn't lying. <laughs> I mean, sometimes he might be lying. But most of the time, I think, what's going on is even 
an alcoholic who really, really wants to be sober, you know, will end up in situations like that. When that alcoholic is there saying, yeah, I'm not going to drink, they're really intending not to drink. And then what happens is they step outside of the psychiatrist's office and they see an advertisement for a beer or they have a memory about drinking or they smell something that smells like, <laughs> this is funny. So um, so I, I'm a, a, in recovery for, among other things, heroin. And um, mango chutney smells exactly like black tar heroin. Um, <laughs> not many people know that. So, um, but it's true. <laughs> Um, so it's just funny because, you know, one of the things that I used to get triggered by a lot early on was, 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 uh, was, was Indian food, with mango chutney, right? So um, anyway, I just think it's interesting. So, um, but, uh, but, 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 you know, the, the alcoholic who's, who promises a psychiatrist he's not going to drink or promises his family he's not going to drink, I, I think can really believe that they're not going to drink and then go out and then get triggered and have cravings and then the executive gets overwhelmed and they end up drinking. And then everybody gets mad at them and then that further reinforces the shame and then they feel terrible about themselves and the whole reason they were drinking to begin with was because they're chronically depressed and anxious and the whole reason they're chronically depressed and anxious is because they have a sense of self rooted in shame anyway, right? And, and, and this, by the way, is how one develops into the role of the identified patient in the family, right? So something bad happens to somebody in the family or they're the person in the family for whom they can't hold the bad thing that's happening, but everybody else can. And so it's traumatic for them. They ex experience chronic uh, depression, anxiety. They start using, they get addicted because of that. And then now they're getting shame because they're the addict in the family, which just reinforces the role, the shame-based role to be, that they were in to begin with. Okay. Um, all right. This part's kind of boring. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, here's the, here's the, the point that I'll, I'll get at is, um, can I go back, so I'm just gonna tease you with that first one there. Um, it's important to screen for trauma when you are doing an assessment. So, um, and in practice, this doesn't need to mean that you, during your assessment, say, do you have trauma, right? Um, a lot of times, people who have trauma don't want to talk about the trauma. They may not even realize that it's trauma, right? Particularly if it was covert trauma, right? A lot of times people who had experiences in their childhood that were sufficiently traumatic that they ended up with, you know, too much shame don't even, you know, will, will report that they actually had good childhoods, right? And in fact, in many respects may have in fact actually had good childhoods. Um, so uh, so, so it, it does require some nuance um, and, um, and, and so, you know, but unfortunately, you know, these are the types of things that can't be subjected to a randomized controlled clinical trial, right? Like how to, how to talk about trauma with your, your, you know, a patient that you're assessing because it's going to be different for each person. It's going to have to do with your personality and that patient's personality and what the dynamic is like between the two of you. Um, so, uh, so these things that are, you know, the tool, the, the studies and the tools that are available for screening for trauma are m more things that are used, um, in research studies and as ways to, you know, to be implemented in, in large healthcare systems where you sort of, um, are, are subjecting people to, to, um, uh, sort of what screens that, that have been, you know, written down and, and have them filling out. Um, uh, you know, paperwork. So that's what um, is actually going to be on the next slide. Um, this is just the DSM-5 criteria for PTSD. Oh, that's another thing. Whenever you read about trauma in the literature, what you're reading about by and large is post-traumatic stress disorder, which is different, in my opinion, than developmental trauma, right? Um, I mean, the fact is that we have essentially one trauma diagnosis in the DSM is sort of like saying like, oh yeah, there's one anxiety disorder. Do you have that or not, right? So, um, but this is the criteria for that. It's exposure to a traumatic event, chronic re-experiencing of it, avoidance of reminders of the trauma, uh, cognitive distortions in mood, uh, to cognitive distortions in mood symptoms, hypervigilance and reactivity. So that's things like um, increased startle reflex, insomnia, um, actually anger and aggression gets put into that category as well. Um, symptoms are there for more than a month. 
Um, there is distress and or functional impairment. That is a symptom of everything in the DSM, um, not due to other causes. And it can either be with, with or without dissociative symptoms and with or without delayed expression. And that's online as well. Um, these are the instruments that I was talking about a second ago in terms of ways to um, screen for trauma. So the sort of gold standard is called the CAPS-5. Um, the, there's the PCL-5. These are things that are useful, I think. I think the appropriate use for these things are, you know, if you want to have um, good outcome measures for your program, this would be the type of thing that would be useful to have people do at the beginning and then do at the end, right? And it'd be a, a way to object, you know, quantify, um, you know, improvement and in insurance companies like that. Um, okay, with or without criterion A, that means basically whether or not the, the, um, the, the sheet asks them about whether they were exposed to a traumatic event or not. Um, there's the SCID, which is super long. There's this thing called the life events checklist that I've never seen in person. Um, there's something called the trauma screening questionnaire, the brief trauma uh, questionnaire, uh, the, clinically, the clin clinician administered PTSD scale. And actually, this is a super useful re resource. It's probably the most useful thing on, on this slide. So um, the VA has a really, uh, for clinicians, has a really um, well put together and exhaustive um, uh, sort of sub web page on, on, on these um, screening tools as well as uh, different, um, all the different trauma treatments, not all of them, but the evidence-based ones um, with nice explanation. So it's a, it's a useful resource. Um, all right, let's talk about treatment. Okay, so when you are talking about treatment for dual diagnosis patients, you are talking about treatment for two different things, two different interrelated things. There's the treatment for the addiction, and then there's the treatment for the underlying emotional cause. Okay, so let's start with treatment for addiction. There are pharmacologic ways to treat addiction, and those um, are basically can be brought, broken down into two different categories, which are drugs to help with the cravings and drugs that modulate the effect of the drug that the pers the, the drug of abuse that the person was using. Let's start with ones for craving. Um, okay, so drugs that are available for opioid craving, there's one called naltrexone. This is my, f of all of the tools that are available to addiction psychiatrists, this is my favorite one. Um, it, it comes in an oral form called Revia. It also comes in a um, injectable form called Vivitrol, which is a shot that people get once a month. Um, the reason I like it though really isn't because of its effect on cravings. It's because of the fact, and I'll talk about that when we get over to this currently blank section of the slide. Um, it's because of the fact that it blocks the effect of opioids. And I'll talk more about that when we get there. Um, uh, this is a controversial, it's even controversial to say it's controversial, um, but, uh, but there, th th there's, there's like a, a massively entrenched different camps. Uh, buprenorphine is the partial agonist opioid that is in Suboxone. Um, you know, uh, the unfortunate thing I think is that people get so emotional and dogmatic about this. Um, you know, it's okay for people to have differing opinions on things. Um, you know, on, on one side you have the addiction psychiatrists who basically, per the opinion of a lot of folks, um, want to over-prescribe Suboxone maintenance. Um, the problems, the, the, the critiques of Suboxone maintenance are A, that it kind of traps people in a recovery purgatory to a certain degree where they're not really sober, but they're also not kind of, they're not using the, the um, abuse, you know, the, the drug they were abusing. Um, and that, you know, it, it essentially, it, it, it's because it numbs people out, you know, their ability to make progress in, in um, psychotherapy is diminished while they're on it. And a third criticism is that it um, is incredibly difficult to come off of once you're on it for more than, you know, a month or two, right? It's got a very long half-life, got its very high affinity for the opioid receptors. And what that means is that those receptors are basically occupied 24-7. Even somebody who's shooting two grams of heroin a day, those receptors get a break throughout the day. And even when the heroin's in, in there, when someone's on Suboxone, if they're on Suboxone for two years, they've had something in their, they've had buprenorphine in their opioid receptors for two years. And so what that means is that when they wanna come off of it, it's, it's really, really, really difficult. The kick is really gnarly and it's really long. 
So um, uh, now the the uh, on the other side, what people will say, the addiction psychiatrists say, is that they're, we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic. People are dying, and at least this keeps people alive. So. Uh, methadone is uh, basically uh, everything I just said about buprenorphine can be said about methadone. The nice thing about buprenorphine relative to methadone is buprenorphine is very hard to overdose on unless you mix it with a benzo. Uh, methadone you can OD on. Uh, LAM is another medication like methadone. Um, okay, for alcohol cravings, guess what? Naltrexone works for that as well. Um, there's something called a camprosate. It's also called camprol. It's a weird drug. Every it's apparently it only works on like French alcoholics. Like meaning, all of the studies in America have been negative, whereas the ones in Europe showed that it worked. The thing I find most interesting about this drug is that the the pill comes in the denomination of the pill is 666 milligrams, which I just thought was an odd choice. By I just it makes you wonder whether they were, you know what I mean? Just. You know, I guess it you know it brings another meaning to the pharmaceutical companies being evil. I guess maybe that that pharmaceutical company may in fact actually be run by the devil. Um, so, uh, topiramate, also called Topamax, has been shown to have some efficacy in reducing cravings for alcohol. Um, side effects can it can for some people have pretty significant cognitive uh, impairment symptoms. Um, nicotine, there's a, a medication called uh, varenicline. It's also called um, Chantix. Um, it's a great med, actually. I mean, I've, I've, um, I've never seen anything in all of psychiatry that's as effective as Chantix is at helping people stop smoking. It's not used very much because sometimes people will get psychotic or manic on it. I feel like <laughs> it's very rare, but that freaks people out. So, um, I, but it works really well. In fact, it was like, it was like the, I mean, you know how hard it is to get people to stop smoking. It was oh, the first like eight or nine people I ever used this with all stopped smoking. It was like the 10th person I tried on that was the first time it didn't work. So, um, and I don't get any money from the drug company that makes it. Uh, bupropion, it's also called Wellbutrin. That's also somewhat effective as well. All right, so effect modulation, this is a shorter side of it. So for opioids, Naltrexone. This is what's awesome about naltrexone. So um, at the Camden Center, um, you know, I have two transitional, there's a men's and a women's transitional living house associated with them. If somebody has a history of opioid dependence and they're coming out of residential treatment. Um, I mandate that if they're gonna come into the house, they have to go on naltrexone, uh, just because that is a period where people tend to overdose is when they've been, you know, had to kind of, you know, uh, they've been sober for, for 30 days, absent for 30 days because they've been in treatment and then they're now coming into transitional living where you know, if they want, they can leave, and, and, and if they buy drugs, it's a, it's a high risk for overdose. So the nice thing about naltrexone is a shot that they get once a month, uh, and if they tr people try to use on it, it's very, very hard to get high. Um, on the third week, you can start to overcome it, and in cases where I'm really worried about it, I'll have people get the shot every three weeks. Um, and for alcohol, there's something called disulfiram. It's also known as antabuse. Um, antabuse gets a bad rap. Um, because every, because every study that's looked at its efficacy has found that it didn't work, um, which is a, a good reason to have a bad rap. Um, Antabuse is, is the, the pill that you know about, even if you don't know, you know that it's the one where if an alcohol, so alcoholics take it, and then if they drink on, on it, they become incredibly nauseous. Um, it, it has some risks if somebody you know, drinks a lot while they're on it somehow, um, you know, the, the side of they can die. Um, usually they just get very ill. Um, the reason that I think that it was shown to be ineffective is because of the way that the tests were done. So typically what they what would happen is, is that, you know, somebody would sign up for a study and then they would just kind of give them a prescription for it and say, okay, go home and take this. Um, my experience is that, you know, if you have somebody who is coming to an IOP program every day, um, then they can go there and have an observed administration of, of this, and that actually tends to, I, I actually found that to be effective in some cases. So, um, yeah, okay. Uh, Non-pharmacologic treatment um, for addiction. Um, so these are the evidence-based treatments, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, contingency management, and DBT. Um, as well as community-based treatments, so 12-step, refuge recovery, and smart recovery. Um, so smart recovery is a little hard for people to use because there just aren't that many meetings. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I will frequently do 
um, in my UCLA program is really encourage people to um, to make use of 12-step meetings, um, even if they uh, if they if they find them off-putting. Um, Primarily because you know it's very very it's hard to get sober without the community-based support, right? So I always say you know listen if you've got a craving in the middle of the night at ten at night you know we're not open you know and but you'll you know you can you can go to a meeting and be able to find a meeting at that time. Um, so uh, okay, treatment for trauma. There are there's pharmacologic treatment for trauma. So let's go through that. Um, I don't know that this is going to be super interesting for most of the people here, so I'll go a little bit quickly, but I'll just try to judge from how you look. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the treatment of choice for uh, anxiety disorders are SSRIs, things like Prozac, Lexapro, Celexa. Um, SNRIs, those are things like Effexor and Cymbalta. I tend to not like those as much because they tend to have pretty significant withdrawal symptoms. In fact, here's something that I think maybe will be useful for the larger community to know, which is the, the antidepressants that have bad withdrawal syndromes associated with them. So Paxil, Effexor, and Cymbalta all have really bad withdrawal syndromes associated with them, as does Vibrid. Um, so uh, a lot of times people don't know that. It's really important because if somebody um, is on Paxil or Effexor and they go on a trip and they forget their meds, they're going to be in really, 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 un they're going to be very uncomfortable. And I think it actually puts them at risk for relapsing if they, if they have an addiction. So, uh, so I, I actually tend to like to use fluoxetine, which is um, a Prozac. Uh, it's been around the longest, so we're not going to figure out like 10 years from now, like, oh, whoops, that caused cancer, like we might with some of the newer ones, um, if, meaning if Prozac was going to cause cancer, we'd know about it right now. Um, and the other thing I like about it is of all of the antidepressants, it has the longest half-life. So what that means is, is that if people forget a dose or go on a trip without it, they're not going to have this really precipitous um, uh, onset of uh, withdrawal symptoms. Um, buspirone, also known as Buspar, um, it's another good one for anxiety. Uh, mirtazapine um, is Remeron. Um, the only issue with that is it causes weight gains, very sedating. Um, um, uh, so anti-adrenergics. So this can be very helpful for people who have trauma-related nightmares. Prazosin, it's actually a prostate <laughs> medication. So um, makes your prostate feel really good too. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Doesn't do that at all. If you want that, you got to look elsewhere. Um, so, uh, <laughs> getting a little loose up here. It's been a long lecture. <laughs> if you need to cut me off at some point, and just like you know, speaking of poor prefrontal inhibition, that's, that's there's a reason. Um, okay, so prazosin um, uh, is actually very effective. It's um, it's for it's for trauma related nightmares. Um, the only thing is it lowers your blood pressure, so if it's not a great one for people who already have low blood pressure, and if somebody's on it, they need to be careful when they get up in the middle of the night to go pee or whatever so that they sit first for a few minutes and then stand up. Um, propranolol, uh, it's a blood pressure, another blood pressure medication. Um, it can also be helpful. Uh, by the way, none of the things that I'm mentioning now are um, addictive. Um, clonidine is, I, you need to be careful with it because people do develop um, a physiologic dependence on that relatively quickly, and if they stop taking it all of a sudden, their blood pressure can go through the roof, which isn't a big deal if they're, you know, 25, but, you know, if, if they're in their 60s and they already have high blood pressure, that can be a problem. Um, okay, this is probably the most important part of the slide, not recommended, are benzos. Um, and is there anything else on there? Oh, yeah, atypical antipsychotics. So, um, uh, the... Benzos are a really important topic, right? So um, I find that there tends to be somewhat of a generational divide with these. So there were psychiatrists that got trained during an era when benzo, where, where benzos were these things that replaced barbiturates. Um, and compared to barbiturates, benzos are awesome, right? So benzos, uh, you know, it's, you, basically you can't die from an overdose unless you mix it with opioids or alcohol, right? So in other words, if you just, you, if you just take a lot of a, a benzo and nothing else, no other CNS suppressant, then you'll, you may sleep for a long time, but you're, you know, it's, they're, they're much safer than, than barbiturates. Um, and most people don't abuse them. 
right? Now, the problem with benzos is that they actually worsen anxiety disorders in the long run. Um, they uh, interfere with the ability of psychotherapy to help them, to help uh, uh, anxiety disorders. Um, they have the potential to be psychologically addictive, um, and they are, for everybody, even if they don't become psychologically addicted to them, they be, everybody will become physiologically dependent. And if somebody's on a benzo for more than a year, it's like buprenorphine in that it is really, really hard to get them off of it, right? So the, 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 the psychiatrists of that generation, I think, really don't know how badly people become physiologically dependent on these, right? So, and 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 most of the prescriptions for benzodiazepines, I, I actually just said, so benzodiazepines are drugs like um, Valium, Xanax, um, Ativan, Clonopin. Um, most of the prescriptions in the United States for benzos are actually written by primary care physicians. So it's a problem and um, you know a lot of times what will happen is I'll have patients that, and, and if somebody has an addiction in, in my opinion it's they're just off limits they hit the same receptors that alcohol does um, and uh, the, the thing that's problematic about it if somebody comes in and has an addiction and they've been on a benzo for two years I can't you can't just take them off you know and, and in fact you you you, you the, the the taper is gonna last longer than the amount of time that they're in um, uh, acute treatment so they're problematic meds Atypical antipsychotics, these are the ones that are typically used for, the one that is typically used for um, anxiety um, is um, Seroquel. And um, it, it actually can be, you know, I, it tends to get used a lot in the patient population, the dual diagnosis patient population, because it's non-addictive. Uh, the problem is, is that it causes a lot of weight gain and exposes patients to risks that aren't really warranted. Um, the drug company that makes it got in big trouble for over promoting its use for off-label uses, and I think we're still feeling the repercussions of that. Many, many, many people get prescribed Seroquel for insomnia, um, and um, there's just lots of other better choices, like hydroxyzine, which hits almost all the same receptors and doesn't have any weight gain or expose it to the, to the same risks. So um, those are my footnotes. Okay, um, psychotherapeutic treatment, okay. So here's the thing that I think is probably the most important point of this lecture, which is concurrent trauma-focused therapy and SUD and substance use disorder treatment um, reduces the severity of PTSD symptoms post-treatment and at long-term follow-up. So for years and years and years, there was this idea that you don't treat, you first you treat the addiction and then you worry about the other stuff, that you don't start treating trauma at the same time that you treat the addiction. Um, and what is anecdotally true and now also has good evidence for it is that in fact actually people with trauma do much better if you treat the trauma and the addiction concurrently. So um, now that doesn't mean that you should start digging up childhood sexual trauma on like the third day of detox from heroin, right? Um, but what it does mean is that um, it's important to make sure that while somebody is in the safety of uh, more intensive treatment, that, that, that the trauma issues do at least get addressed with a plan for how they're going to continue to be treated when they step down. Um, so um, now, uh, the interestingly, using trauma-focused therapy, um, and by the way, all of the studies look at evidence-based trauma therapies, and that's an important caveat because, by and large, my experience is, is that it's not actually the evidence-based trauma therapies that are ones that are most effective for trauma. Uh, um, but uh, in any case, um, but what the studies have found, what a, it was a Cochrane study, which is a, a, a meta-analysis, is that um, the substance use uh, uh, disorder severity only went down at long-term follow-up when there was concurrent treatment. Um, now, one of the downsides of it is that it may result in fewer patients completing treatment, right? So that was the, now keep in mind, this is, was the conclusion that was drawn from looking at a meta-analysis, a meta which is looking at a whole bunch of, of studies. And um, I think that this makes intuitive sense, right? So, um, and, and honestly, I think this is the thing where the art of how this is done is where the importance is. It's like the importance is in the details, right? Which is... You know, do you take somebody who has a ton of trauma and is, you know, 10 days sober and put them in prolonged exposure therapy? No, <laughs> right? Whereas that may in fact be what, you know, or if you're doing a study that's looking at, 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 um, at evidence-based 
um, psychotherapies for trauma, you know, prolonged exposure is one of them. So, okay, that's the that's the meta the meta analysis I was talking about. Okay. Um, all right, so evidence-based psychotherapeutic modalities for post-traumatic stress, uh, stress disorder. So um, here's what the another meta-analysis showed: trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy and non-trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy and EMDR are superior to other modalities that were looked at. Um, trauma-focused CBT, EMDR, and non-trauma-focused CBT are equally effective immediately post-treatment. Trauma-focused CBT and EMDR are superior at one to four months post-treatment than um, non-trauma-focused CBT. And this is the meta-analysis that uh, shows that. Okay. Now, the thing that is difficult about psychotherapy is it does not lend itself to randomized controlled clinical trials, right? One of the things that has been consistently found is that the only characteristic that is consistently correlated with improvement in psychotherapy is the degree to which the patient feels that the therapist was attuned to them, right? And that is not something that can be standardized. That's not something you can put in a manual. That's not something that anybody other than the people in the room know is happening. And so, um, you know, this gets to a sort of larger epistemological issue. So epistemology is the study of knowledge, right? Which is just because something can't or doesn't lend itself to being evaluated via the means which we use to evaluate things, which are randomized controlled clinical trials, doesn't mean that it's not effective, right? And I think that as, you know, one of the things that I think is important is to just sort of ask ourselves what our, what's our goal, right? You know, our goal is to help people heal. Our goal isn't to prove to other people that we're right, right? So proving to other people that you're right, that's what you do in academics. And that's why all of these, and all these studies are done by academicians, right? So, um, you know, my mentor one time said to me that the, the, the arguments in academia are so vicious because the stakes are so small. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's really true. You've got really emotionally immature folks just clawing at each other over nothing, over <laughs> reputation, right? It's not even about money, right? Um, so um, so the, um, the thing that I think is, but you know, still, like even for this lecture, you know, like in order to, to be responsible, I need to let you guys know what are the, tr the, the evidence-based treatments, right? And, um, but I also want to say that, you know, there are other treatments for um, trauma that do not have as strong of an evidence base for them. And I will say what those are. Um, so EMDR, obviously that's in both categories. Somatic experiencing, post-induction therapy, trauma resiliency model, and good old psychodynamic therapy, right? Um, you know, at the Camden Center, where I, I can do whatever I want since I run it, um, th this is what we use, right? We don't do prolonged exposure at the Camden Center. Now, they do prolonged exposure at the VA, and they have to do prolonged exposure at the VA because prolonged exposure has got the best evidence based for it. That's one of the evidence based cognitive behavioral therapies, right? Um, but in my experience, you know, the, the reason that prolonged exposure has got a good evidence base for it is because, guess what, you don't really need attunement with, between the therapist and the patient, right? It certainly helps, right? Attunement always helps between the therapist and the patient, but the mechanism by which people get better in prolonged exposure, it doesn't rest critically on attunement. These, the therapist needs to be able to attune to the patient. In my experience is you can't teach, that's not something you can teach a therapist, you know? That's just my opinion, but I, I really do think that that, however, is the way that, you know, for people who um, have, have been hurt, particularly in the context of relationships in which they were disempowered, right? So typically when we're developing, you know, it's in the context of a relationship with an authority. Um, having that, having attunement to the patient is 
in my opinion, actually the thing that is necessary in order for people to get better. And for all the reasons that I said earlier in this lecture, if you want somebody to get better from an addiction, you got to get all the way down to the root. And I think that actually that's where it happens, right? It's in the room with the therapist who's attuned to the patient. Whether, you know, which one of these is better, I, I, I don't know. My feeling is, another thing is that the best thing to do is to be open-minded about what's working with one particular patient. It may be totally different than worked, what worked with a different patient. Those are my references, and that's it. Question? We have time for about three questions. Oh, hold on. Hi, okay. thank you very much. Um, my question is about one thing that <clears throat> you didn't reference is what if a patient has um, organic problems, like a brain injury, mm -hmm. stroke, any other? So <clears throat> do you, you have to address that first? Or do you, you understand where is that in the mix? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, thanks for asking. And, and, and actually, I think that um, one of the things that needs to be done during an assessment is actually screening for any organic issues as well and making sure that those are addressed. That frequently will come up, for example, with patients who may have concurrent eating disorders, right? So if a patient has you know, a, a, a significant eating disorder, there may be uh, metabolic derangements that are actually affecting their cognition. So. Yeah. Yes, that's right. If somebody has a brain injury, they may in fact actually have damaged their prefrontal cortex and obviously that may set a lower limit on what can, yeah. One more. Can you tell us a little bit more about harm reduction and the uh, way you see the things sure. through your lens? Yeah, so, um, so har the question was about harm reduction. Um, uh, and thank you for bringing that up because I think it's a really important point that's sort of actually parallel to what I was discussing here. So m my feeling, and again, I, the, the caveat here is these are just, this is just my opinion, so feel free to disagree with me. Uh, but my opinion is that um, there really are, you can divide patients into two broad categories. You've got the patients who on a fundamental level are done and want to get better in treatment and, and, and patients who don't want to stop using. Um, and uh, I don't think that it is the right thing to do to try to pitchfork patients who aren't done, who don't want to stop using into, into treatment. Um, so uh, it, it, in that patient population, patients that are still using, they don't have a desire to stop. Um, and um, thus are unwilling to do all of the things that one might need to do in order to get better, I think actually harm reduction is um, the, the, really the only ethical treatment that's really available, right? So um, it's, it's a way to allow people to um, continue to use, which again, in my opinion, is their right. Um, and um, although I guess technically not if it's their illegal drugs, but in my opinion it is. Um, and, um, and, and do so in a way where they are at least not put at risk for things to, you know, that will result in significant pathology or mortality, you know, while they're using and ideally can stay healthy so that when they get, so if they do decide to get sober at some point, they don't get sober and then have HIV or hep C or numerous other problems. Two things. First of all, what is posting Reduction therapy? Well, funny you should ask, since we have the meadows. Uh, no, just so uh, post-induction therapy was actually is a, is a trauma treatment that was uh, developed by Pia Melody, who is the uh, founder of the meadows. Yeah, but what do they do? I don't give a damn about that. What is the actual treatment? Is it uh, hypnosis? Oh, what is it? What is yeah, it actually? Tell me do? what it is. Are you using the unconscious mind, perhaps, with an induction, or are you doing something different? <laughs> no, that's. <laughs> It's really funny. Um, so That's um, how we learn, you know, being funny. Yeah. So, um, so I am not a specialist in post-induction therapy, so I can give you very broad strokes uh, explanation. Um, that basically what it does is is that it looks at sort of what developmental um, needs were um, not met, um, and sort of what uh, thus uh, developmental stage people tend to be stuck at. Um, and has sort of as, as, a, as a foundation of the theory the idea that a lot of what causes um, a suffering as an adult is our striving as adults to get unmet childhood needs met as an adult. 
Um, and then in terms of the methodology by which that heals, I'm, I, I, I it absolutely remember. heals. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Schiffman. Appreciate it. Great talk. If you have some questions, he'll be around to answer them. Hopefully we'll see you in two months.